Dr. Yamawaki's accolades are almost too many to count, but we've asked Dr. Diana Duan, who is Assistant Professor of History here in the college, to uh, share many of those accolades with us and to introduce Dr. Yamawaki and her lecture to us today. Dr. Duan. Thank you. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Yamawaki. And Dr. Niwako Yamawaki is a model of diversity and inclusion in the Department of Psychology. Dr. Yamawaki's research seeks to understand the effects of sexism, stereotypes, and gender role traditionality on attitudes toward violence against women. She also examines the role of cultural factors, including stigma, discrimination, and collectivism on mental health service utilization. She was awarded the Japan Society for Promotion of Science Bridge Fellowship and serves as Psychology Department Associate Chair. And on the Psychology Diversity and Inclusion Committee, where she helped create a thriving summer research program for minority and underprivileged researchers. Let's welcome Dr. Yamawaki. Thank you, Dr. Duan. Uh, as we welcome Dr. Yamawaki, I will just uh, in, remind everyone that we would like to welcome your questions uh, to be presented to Dr. Yamawaki at the end of the talk. You can include those either in the chat function at the bottom of the screen, or there is also a Q&A function. So please do type those questions and welcome to Dr. Yamawaki. Dr. Yamawaki, you're muted. There we go. Oh, hello now. <laughs> it is my heartfelt honor to speak to you today after receiving the prestigious Martin B. Hickman, uh, Hickman Diversity and Inclusion Award. I am in debt to the legacy of Dr. Hickman and his family for their commitment to supporting and promoting the cause of diversity and inclusion in academia, particularly at BYU. Because people like Dr. Hickman have valued diversity and inclusion, I stand before you today. I will forever be grateful for their values and vision and I'm in their debt. Today, I would like to talk about my experience as an immigrant. I was born and raised in a very small fishing village in Japan. Here is my hometown. Beautiful, isn't it? It is called Usa. This sign is not saying, welcome to the United States of America. There is no the in front of USA, USA. The letter USA are simply the English way of spelling the pronunciation of my home village name, pronounced USA. Isn't the name of my home village ironic and funny? My parents were both very loving but they did not believe in, in a college education for women, maybe because neither one of them were college graduates. Although my father was an accomplished captain of a large worldwide voyaging fishing ship. My life changed drastically when I was 14. I met two LDS missionaries and started learning about Heavenly Father, Christ, and this church. Since then, my life purpose has become to, be, to obey God and do my best. After I got an accounting job in the fifth biggest insurance company in Japan, I thought, hey, my life was going wonderfully. It was a great paying job and I was valued and happy there. However, I started feeling very uneasy 
because I heard a clear voice that I had to go to America. I did not know the purpose of this call since I was happy where I was, surrounded by loving family and supportive friends. I thought I had everything. To make my story short, I quit my job, being temporarily disowned by my father and jumped on a flight to the US. I just want you to know that it was a very difficult decision for me. Like myself, approximately 40 million people living in the United States were born abroad. Some 14% of the entire population. An estimated 460 languages are currently spoken in homes in the United States. Some researchers categorize immigrants based on their visa status. But here, why don't I categorize them based on their reasons for immigration? Voluntary versus involuntary or forced. Voluntary immigrants come to the US by their own choice, usually searching for better economic and educational opportunities. As a voluntary immigrant, I prepared myself financially and psychologically. Then I came to the US as an international student. I studied very hard without any moral support. At the time, I still did not know why I had left a comfortable home and had come to these harsh, emotionally challenging circumstances. Why was it harsh? Well, even though I had prepared well, there were so many things I did not know. Now, I can joke about this. Right after a couple of semesters at LDS Business College, now called Ensign College, I saw that a picture of my face had been posted on a wall along with other students. I was so afraid to find out why my face had been posted there, but I could not ask anyone due to the fear that I may have done something very wrong. I did not, um, I did not have any friends at the time because I was so afraid of speaking English and making mistakes. So for a while, I avoided passing the wall with my picture on it. Later, I found out that the pictures on the wall were students who had made the Dean's List. Both voluntary and forced or involuntary immigrants encounter language barriers. The language barriers are particularly difficult for many immigrants' psyche because they usually first try to assimilate into this new culture. I was one of these. I really wanted to blend into this new culture. Although I tried hard, I felt that I could not blend in. I believed that this was because my accent, improper grammar and pronunciation, and my unusual name, Niwako, prevented me from being assimilated into this exciting new country. I thought that 
if I overcame the language barrier, I will be able to be accepted. So I thought that the best way to assimilate was to immerse myself into American culture by only speaking English, hanging out with only Americans, while cutting ties with Japanese friends and not speaking Japanese at all. But the only thing I could not do was to give up Japanese food. It is too good. Many immigrants go through this psychological acculturation, a process of cultural and psychological change that result following the meeting between cultures. I think this model is a good tool for immigrants to understand what is going on inside themselves and is a helpful resource for those who work with them. It is called Barry's acculturation model. These are the questions here, why don't I read? Is it considered to be of value to develop relationship with the larger society? So in my case, larger society was America. And then here, is it considered to be of value to maintain one's own cultural heritage, which is for me, Japanese heritage. So if it is yes and no here, those assimilation. So there are four stages and I have experienced all four stages. As I mentioned, I experienced the first stage, assimilation. Assimilation is only valuing developing a relationship with American culture while placing no value on maintaining one's own cultural heritage. Then I moved on to the next stage. It's called marginalization marginalized by both cultures. As time passed, I realized that I still felt isolated and had not become blended. I could not make sense of why. So I started blaming myself, blaming who I am. I really thought that it was because there was something wrong with my personality. I must not be good, fun, or a valuable enough person for people to accept me. This was the dark time that I completely lost confidence in myself. I did not value myself at all. During this time, one return missionary from Japan asked me to study together with him. We both had the same goal, to go to graduate school. We studied together hard and I was happy to find such a great friend. Therefore, I wanted to share the good news with him when I was accepted by several graduate program. When I shared this news with him, he said, Niwako, you are accepted because you are an Asian woman. Affirmative action is working for you. I was shocked. Did he not realize that I was graduating with my bachelor's degree within two and a half years with a 4.0 GPA? Did he not know 
that I had gotten a perfect score on my GRE math section? Apparently not. He was simply making rush, rush assumptions about my successful acceptance to grad schools. When I was discussing this experience with my Vietnamese friend, Lee, she told me that it might be due to racial discrimination. I felt devastated and became even more isolated because I felt marginalized from both Japanese and American communities. I felt no longer completely Japanese, but also not yet American. I call this stage cultural homelessness. Third stage, separation. Taking distance from the main culture and valuing only one's own heritage. I got angry, angry at American society. I had made so much effort. So why can't American accept me? So I decided to separate myself from American culture and only focus on the wonderful thing about my native Japanese culture. I sometimes told my Japanese friends that many Americans are stupid because they even cannot do simple math like calculating restaurants tip for servers. Japanese on the other hand are very good at math. Fourth stage, integration. But I soon realized very quickly that what I was thinking was so wrong. There are so many Americans who are brilliant at math, very accepting, warm and loving. On the other hand, there are many Japanese who cannot do math, are mean, and are disrespectful. So I decided to take the greatest things from both cultures. During this stage, I created an immigrant sisters club within my diverse LDS ward. It consisted of sisters from Ecuador, the Marshall Islands, Taiwan, and Spain. We met together often, discussing our experiences in the US. Within a short time, we had become a source of energy and joy in our world. We introduced our culture, food, and language, and we supported each other and became welcome into and well blended within our world. While voluntary immigrants may have time to prepare for their migration, involuntary immigrants such as refugees are forced to migrate, in some cases immediately leave their own country and therefore come to the new culture without having had time to prepare. Many involuntary immigrants have gone through trauma. Why don't I go back to my Vietnamese friend Lee and her harrowing story. 
when we were discussing my acculturation experience, she started sharing her own immigration experience. This was the first time I had heard from Lee that she was an involuntary immigrant, a refugee from Vietnam. She spoke English perfectly. Lee started <clears throat> talking about her horrific experience on a small fishing boat. <coughs> Lee was one of the boat people who fled from Vietnam like this. She was only five when she was brought to the US. Lee said she was always dehydrated, hungry, and scared. The United Nations High Commissioners on Refugees estimates that one third of those who escaped by boat from Vietnam died from the journey, a journey similar to that which Lee experienced. <coughs> The most disturbing part of Lee's story still shakes me today. Lee said that every night she heard women screaming and crying. She did not know why they were doing this and her parents tried to put their fingers in her little ears so that she could not hear. Even so, she saw that every night, a different woman, including her own mother, was taken into the captain's room. She later realized that those women had all been raped by the captain of the boat. Her experiences in the boat still haunted her and shake me even today. I felt her pain and the pain of all those women. Recently, I also experienced heart-wrenching pain. Believe or not, I care about the students I have encountered through the courses I teach. But in particular, I love my research assistants because I get to know them personally at a deeper level. They are also persons who truly understand human pain. One of my RAs is also an involuntary immigrant. One day when she was eating lunch at the Wilkinson Center at BYU, Two male students approached and told her, you, the N-word, go back to your own country. I was irate because this RA, whom I love and care about, was extremely hurt, scared, and degraded. I realized that my emotion was not just anger, rather, I found that it was disappointment, pain, and sadness. In the current anti-immigrant climate, xenophobia and discrimination significantly impact the lives of immigrants in the United States. 
According to some researchers, this is because native born Americans sometimes view immigrants as taking away their jobs and bringing undesirable cultural practices. Therefore, many immigrants are discriminated against in their workplace and across a range of other microsystems, including their neighbors, service agencies, and schools. But I believe that immigrants bring welcome and healthy diversity to American society as always been the case. Immigrants to the US have varied level of education. At one end of the spectrum are highly educated immigrants. 25% of all US physicians, 24% of the nation's science and engineering workers, and 47% of scientists with doctorate are foreign born. At the other end of spectrum, some immigrants have educational level far below those of native born Americans. Some sectors of the US labor market are particularly uh, reliant on so-called low skilled immigrants, including agriculture, service and construction industry. As church members, we know that diversity is a crucial blessing to survival in this extremely global world. In fact, Joseph Smith received a revelation from the Lord in regard to the lost 10 tribes coming back to Zion saying, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servant. Immigrants are treasure to our country. They always have been. About a year ago, I visited New York with my sister, my nephew, and my husband who is taking picture and saw the Statue of Liberty. Inside of the statue, I saw a quote by Emma Lazarus, the new Colossus, saying, she said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these homeless tempest toast to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This is our tradition and I myself I'm a part of this tradition. When I heard so many stories from my RAs, research assistants, I just cried and was very depressed. One was called the N-word and another one was reported to the owner code office because he, who had come out as gay, was simply chatting with his male friends. I also had an RA who was an undocumented immigrant. She was often mistreated 
and discriminated against. During this painful time, somehow, I think about Jesus, the scars in his hands are the proof of his suffering and pain. Even though he was resurrected and has a perfect body, he decided to keep his scars. This is because of course, he wanted to show that he is the savior. But I believe that he decided to keep his scars because he wants us to know that he also suffered and experienced so much pain Then I felt extremely close to him. Karen Armstrong, who is a religious scholar said, compassion means to endure something with another person, to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes to feel her or his pain as though it were our own and to enter generously into her or his point of view. I know that each one of us experience pain and suffering, each one of you. I believe that as a Christian, it is crucial, crucial to feel others' pain and act compassionately towards others because that is what God wants us to practice. Lastly, I gradually found out why the Lord inspired me to come to this country. There were many reasons. I married a wonderful American man and was honored to become an American citizen. Now I am an American citizen no longer a Japanese citizen because I have to throw my Japanese citizenship to become American citizen. My loyalty is to America. But my recent experiences have really struck me and make me ponder why I am here. One of my research assistants recently told me that he was not originally planning to come to BYU Provo. He was thinking about going somewhere else because of the pain he felt as an immigrant and minority. He was discriminated badly and he felt pain. But now he has told me why he came to BYU. He said that it is because I am here to support him in a way that has become a comfort and blessing to him. I am honored to play this role in his life. My gosh, God works in mysterious ways. 
I was not originally sure why I felt an urge to come to this country, leaving comfortable home, a perfect life, I thought. I have come to realize now that I was one of the dots comprising God's ways of mystery. I now am grateful for my pain. If I had not immigrated to the US, I likely would have had a comfortable life without much pain in Japan. But my pain as an immigrant and minority has made me who I am today. I, like so many immigrants who went through pain and suffering, seek to offer a contribution as a rich treasure to Zion. We are building on the legacy of those immigrants who came before us. Thank you so much for the honor to have spoken to you today. Thank you very much. Mikaela, you are mute. Ah, that's our tradition today, apparently, is to be muted as we start. Thank you, Dr. Yamawaki, for those beautiful remarks. There's, there's so much in what you said today for us to take into our hearts and to um, take forward with us into our own communities. Uh, and you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat and in the Q&A as well. I'd just like to remind people to uh, feel free to add some questions for Dr. Yamawaki in the, the chat and the, the Q&A as well. We do have one question from Crystal who has asked, how did you overcome the homelessness phase. I sometimes feel the same. I don't completely belong in my country, but I also feel like I'm not part of America. Yes. Oh, I, I was there. I was there. I even went through therapy for this because cultural homelessness um, make me feel more and more isolated, very alone. It was very difficult for me. And the therapist actually recommended me because at that time, my visa status was um, actually not a citizen, but um, um, green card holder. So what I did was I decided to change my visa status from, um, from um, that to citizenship. So, I have physical home. Before, I always think that when something happened to me, then I cut the ties, the American culture, and then going back to Japan. I always have the bridge, but I decided to burn the bridge and then decided to become American. Um, that actually made me feel a little settled because before I was always going back and forth and back and forth. So that is how I overcome my cultural homelessness. I hope it does make sense, Christy. Okay, we have a question from Scott who says, you said your father disowned you. Were you reunited with your family? Yes, I did. Well, um, when I told my father that I, I am leaving Japan to the US, I told my father, and at the time my mother was already passed away, and also my aunt, we are very close. I told them two days prior, I left, uh, I left Japan. So all of my uh, relatives, and my, including my father, were so surprised and they were so angry and they said, no, 
you are no longer Yamawaki. So get out, basically. But um, I kept contacting them and, and my father did not really pick up the phone. But um, later uh, he started softening his heart and then now he understood and he actually am very grateful that I, I was working hard in the US and become a professor. Um, he passed away about 10 years ago, but he, he knew when he left this earth, he knew that I was in the good place. So it was hard, but I made it. Thank you, Scott, for your question. We have a question from Annalisa. I'm an immigrant and will soon become a US citizen. I have five children and trying to teach them about their heritage. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips on how to maintain that heritage with our US born children? Ah, uh, I don't have kids, unfortunately, so I'm not sure. However, using my psychology um, knowledge, I've heard that talking to children in their own language and practicing um, that your own cultural heritage is actually very good thing for kids. So for example, even language development, it's really good for kids to um, have two different language, learn two different languages. So I want you to be who, I, who you are and then talk about who you were and also what your culture was. And I think it would, it would be very great for your kids. And also, sometime soon, uh, your kids will decide uh, which one they will be identified with. And at the time, um, you have both support, correct? So good luck. Very good luck. Uh, a question from Melanie. Do you think that people who aren't immigrants but are of different racial backgrounds here in the US can still feel similar feelings and go through similar stages to the ones you described? Yes, the research studies show very, very clearly that xenophobia and also uh, discrimination also impact the minority here, American-born minority here. Because it was so interesting, but um, my friend Diana, who uh, introduced me, um, she is uh, from Chi Chinese background, and I am from Japanese background. Can you tell who is Japanese and you know Chinese? No, there is no way. I cannot even tell. So other um, people cannot tell uh, whether or not they are from America or they are American born until they speak to uh, each other. So yes, um, they definitely American born minority definitely feel what I felt and also other fel uh, fields. And um, I have a client from um, Navajo um, Reservation. And he actually went through the same acculturation model that I experienced. So this acculturation model may be able to be applied uh, to American born people. Along those lines, thinking about uh, those stages of assimilation, James asks, do you think that it's almost universal for immigrants to struggle through those stages? Um, um, I'm not sure, but for my case and also for my clients, because I'm a licensed psychologist, um, for my clients, every time I explain about this assimilation or acculturation model, they feel so relieved because they thought that this kind of stages that they are going through are so unique to them. But like myself, I was so happy that somebody named my experience. And that was very, very comforting for me. So I'm not sure every each one of the immigrants um, experience 
However, I think especially minority or English as a second language immigrants may tend to go through this four stages. And interestingly, I thought I went through all four stages and then went to integration, but sometimes I went back to marginalization. It's so interesting, but I'm still going through some stages and it depends on what happened at that time and what you experienced. It's so interesting that we think of it as a straight path to go through stages, but it's just- I, I know it's not always true. Uh, we have a couple of questions specifically about BYU. So I'm, I'm curious to see how you'll, you'll handle these. Carmen asks, do you think BYU is a better environment for immigrants thanks to the church's influence or is it worse because of the overwhelmingly white student body which can make immigrants feel even more marginalized? Ooh, well, I think the intention of students here are all good. I really want to believe in good in people and good, um, good in church members. Uh, but sometimes um, because they've never uh, identified with immigrants. So sometimes it might be difficult for them to understand. But like I said, um, they all go through pain. So when you universalize your pain to other people who you have, um, who, who have completely different background, I think it works. Um, it will work. Um, BYU, I love BYU students. They are good people, but there are some people who are so hurt. So that's why they may want to pinch, uh, replace their pain to other people. And that happens all the time, not only BYU students, but also other people. So um, my answer to that, I don't think just only BYU. And as you may not realize, you mentioned that majority of uh, BYU students are white, but actually there are many students who are immigrated or international students or minority students. So uh, you may think that they are all white, but actually it may not be true. Uh, along the BYU lines, uh, if you're willing to answer this one, Soraya <laughs> asks, have you experienced discrimination from people at BYU, from colleagues, superiors? I would throw students in there too, so. Sure, sure. Um, I was told token minority, and I was told by many students, oh, of course, my, my English is not perfect. In, in Japanese language, there is no L and R. So uh, it's so in, uh, difficult for me to say broccoli or <laughs> correlation. But anyway, when I speak, uh, some students don't understand what I'm saying. So at the time, please be patient. But anyway, um, I was told by many students that your test is so difficult to understand because uh, you, you, are, you, are, you are not native speaker. But actually, I took some items from um, Test Bank, which was um, created by English speakers. And also, I showed to my colleagues, saying, uh, asking whether or not these uh, items are clear enough. And they all said, there is no typo, there is no grammatical errors, and so on. But still, students said, because you are not native speaker. That's why your test sucks. Well, um, that's not actually true. But anyway, yes, um, I have some experience, but maybe because I'm a, a professor here, so I have a little bit more power. So a student may not say directly to me. Uh, we have a question from Jake, who also says, great job, Aunt Iwako. So proud of you. <laughs> so, uh, he's curious how your views of immigrants and immigration have changed. 
So when, when you lived in Japan, did you think one way about people who immigrated to Japan? Did that change when you became an immigrant yourself mm-hmm. uh, or when you came to America or through your studies? How, how have your views changed? Well, when I was in Japan, luckily, I've never thought that I am Japanese because it's, I'm Japanese anyway. I've never thought that, I've never even questioned about my identity. It was given. But um, when you go to other countries, which other you know, L- LDS missionaries are experienced, um, I think all of us who went to other countries and live other countries have this experience. Your immigration, the concept of immigration definitely changes. Um, but at the same time, it depends on the country you go. Some places are very, very welcoming. Um, my husband and I went to Denmark and Sweden. And in Denmark, we saw a very uh, wonderful pictures showing um, the diversities and welcoming immigrants is a wonderful thing. But on the other hand, some countries um, actually have very harsh feeling towards immigrants. So I think it depends on the countries where you are going. But um, if you are only staying in, in America, you never thought that you are American, maybe. I don't know. But when you go to other countries and live there, uh, your I- identity will be shaken sometimes. Uh, we do have a question from Doug, and I don't know if you'll know the, the answer, Dr. Yamawaki, but uh, he says, in 1896, a majority of BYU students were immigrants, which of oh. course had a lot to do with who lived in Utah, you know, people immigrating oh, to Utah that. because of the church diaspora. Uh, and in the 1970s, it seemed to him as a student that about 10% of students were international students. Do you know what percentage of BYU students are international students today? I don't know, but I've heard about around 10 to 15%. Mm -hmm. That's what I've heard. I've never really actually checked that, but um, it's it's more than you think actually. So there are many, many uh, uh, immigrant students. It's really interesting. Um, We're almost out of time. I think there's one more question that that we can get to and it's one that's uh, come up from a few different people. So apologize, uh, apologize. Apologies to our friends uh, whose questions we didn't get to. Thank you for sending those in. Uh, But we have a question from Madison and a question from our own uh, Jane Lopez that is essentially asking, what can people who are native born uh, do to help smooth these processes for our immigrant brothers and sisters? Are there steps that you would recommend people who've had their eyes opened to these experiences you've talked about today can do to help? Well, I think um, very helpful thing for me was, you know, people are so excited about learning about my ori- uh, original uh, cu- culture or country, which is, you know, country of o- origin, which is Japan. They are very, very interested. They are very open, and uh, they they are not really uh, afraid of making mistakes, but they always said, you know, I'm sorry if I make mistake and if I offend you, but um, this welcoming, um, uh, always kind of asking or inviting someone was very, very great experience for me. So um, just be open and be Christian. I think that is the best way to do. Well, that's a perfect place to end because what a perfect message for all of us to to be Christian and take those Christian ideals into our hearts. um, Thank you very, very much. I I know that we won't be able to hear applause like we normally would in person, but I hope you'll all join me in thanking Dr. Yamawaki for her wonderful remarks here today. Uh, And I hope you'll get a chance, Dr. Yamawaki, to look at some of the chat and and question uh, things that are telling you how wonderful you are. Uh, We're so fortunate to have you here and to have had your uh, wisdom today. Thank you again, Dr. Yamawaki, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us today.